Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited about the overwhelming interest in this funding opportunity. So we're really glad that everybody has joined us to learn more about the Ocean Odyssey Grants, the Marine Debris Prevention Awards for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Justice, and Accessibility. I'm Erin Jazak, and I'm the Senior Program Operations Manager for the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And joining me today is Kaya McGaw, who is the Foundation's Program Operations Coordinator for Marine Debris Programs. And from the NOAA Marine Debris Program, um, whose, whose funding makes this program possible, and we're so grateful for that, is Haley Dalian, the Great Lakes Regional Coordinator for the NOAA Marine Debris Program. Next slide. Um, before we get started, I just want to share a few housekeeping items. I want to let everybody know that we are recording this and we will send it out with some additional resources after the webinar. All the attendees today are muted and cameras are off and the chat is disabled, but we do have the question and answer section open. So if any questions come up as we go through the webinar, feel free to pop them into the Q&A. We'll be monitoring them and at the end of the webinar, we'll be answering as many of those as we can. But what we plan to cover with you in the next hour is an overview of the Foundation's Ocean Odyssey Grant Program, some details about the 2025 award and the requirements to apply for this funding opportunity, how to submit your applications into the Foundation's online portal for grant applications and management, and then we'll uh, address some of the questions that you all submit throughout the webinar. Next slide, please. We just wanted to share briefly a little bit of history about the Ocean Odyssey Grants Program. If this is new to you, this actually started out of a partnership between the foundation and the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration more than 20 years ago. And out of that partnership to help produce some uh, educational materials and professional development for teachers, the first mini grants were introduced in 2021, and that was the Ocean Exploration Education Mini Grants. And then we were super excited three years later to launch a new program under the Ocean Odyssey Grants in partnership with the NOAA Marine Debris Program. And just this spring, we issued our first round of awards to uh, 12 grantees under the Marine Debris Awards. Next slide. This is just a fun snapshot to show you the history of this um, grant program. The Ocean Exploration Awards for Education are entering their fourth year. They're in the process of reviewing grant applications right now. Under the Marine Debris Program, we issued our first grants in April of this year. So those 12 grantees are halfway through their projects. And we are super excited to have this next round of funding open with the awards that will be issued in the spring of 2025. Next slide. And I'm gonna hand it over to Haley with the NOAA Marine Debris Program to talk about some of the priorities for this funding opportunity. Yes, thank you, Erin. The objective of this funding opportunity is to further DEJA initiatives to address the adverse impacts of marine debris by supporting marine debris prevention, education, and outreach activities in communities that are either underserved, underrepresented, or overburdened by marine debris. This means that projects should focus on marine debris prevention, education, and outreach activities. For this year's competition, we are not considering projects requesting funding for marine debris removal from the natural environment, such as beach cleanups, funding for interception technology, or research projects. We wanna emphasize that there are many ways to have a positive impact by stemming the flow of marine debris into our environment. This competition's focus on prevention encourages applicants to think creatively about those many ways that we can stop the flow of marine debris long before it has an opportunity to reach the environment. The RFP also provides some examples of eligible projects, uh, but not an exhaustive list. The foundation anticipates awarding 10 to 15 projects, ranging from $5,000 to $10,000 in awards per project. Next slide, please. 
The RFP also lists several priorities for the competition, which aligns with the evaluation criteria and should be carefully reviewed after this webinar. But to summarize, uh, the project priorities um, will have preference given to those that clearly identify and address a marine debris issue through prevention, education, or outreach, projects that directly benefit and involve community members in all aspects of the project from planning to implementation, projects that include an evaluation plan to assess and demonstrate impact within the 12 month period of performance, and finally projects that also continue to benefit the community or support their project outcomes after the project period has ended. In addition to these priorities, please reference the full evaluation criteria that your proposal will be evaluated against in the RFP. And I will now turn it over to Aaron with the next slide. I wanted to take a minute to review with you the timeline for this opportunity. Um, as you know, the applications are open and being accepted right now, and the application process will close on November 20th. Um, for the rest of November and December, we'll be reviewing all of the reviewed, uh, the received proposals. And in February, we'll be reaching out to all applicants to, to let them know if they've been selected or if their project has not been selected. In March, we'll be working on getting grant agreements in place and making a public announcement on the selection of projects. And then the award implementation will start on April 1st. And these are 12 month awards. And there is a requirement for two reports to be submitted during that period. And there'll be an interim report halfway through and then a final report just after the conclusion of the projects in March, 2026. Next slide, please. Okay, I want to talk about eligibility because this is one of the most common questions that we get uh, regarding this RFP. So essentially, to be eligible to apply for this funding opportunity, projects need to be taking place in the U.S. coastal United States or in the Great Lakes region or in uh, U.S. territory or freely associated state. Um, grantees will be required to submit a W-9, so you do need to have a tax ID number to be eligible. But lots of different types of organizations and entities are eligible to apply, and that includes schools, colleges, and universities, nonprofit organizations, for-profit organizations. So if you are a for-profit organization, you are eligible to apply for this funding opportunity as well as any type of group that serves indigenous communities, including tribal governments that are recognized or not federally recognized. And also any state and local entities are eligible to apply. Who's not eligible are entities that are outside of the US or freely associated states or US territory, uh, federal agencies or federal employees and individuals. Next slide, please. Now, some of the things that you'll need to apply for this funding opportunity, and this is all very detailed in the request for proposals, is you'll need to register in the foundation's uh, platform called CSTAR, Collaborative System for Awards, Activities, and Reporting. This is where you'll set up a profile, you'll submit your application, and those that are selected for funding will have their grant agreements processed through this portal, and reports will be submitted through here as well after you've registered in CSTAR, and we're gonna, we're gonna take a little bit of time to go through this platform and show you what it looks like so that you can be familiar with it before you submit your applications. But the next thing that will happen is you'll actually download the template for the application from the request for proposals. You'll complete that template and upload it to the portal. In addition to the application being uploaded, you'll upload any supplemental materials that you want to submit. And these can include letters of support. So if your project has a partner that's an integral part of your project, then you should submit a letter of support from that partner. But you can, support, you can submit letters from other entities or organizations or community members that are in support of the project that you're doing as well. Next slide please. 
Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Kaya now, who's going to walk you through the Foundation C-Star platform. Awesome. So I'm actually going to share my screen and show you all the, the how to register in C-Star, how to set up your organization profile, as well as what the application will actually look like so you can kind of get a feel for that. So in the RFP is the link to C-Star. It will take you to this page. I obviously already have an account, so I normally just click log in. But what you all will do is say new to the system and click register. As Aaron mentioned, only organizations or entities are um, allowed to apply for this, this position or this opportunity, not individuals. So you'll click organizations. Here you'll put your full organization legal name as it appears on your W-9. Aaron also mentioned that in order to apply for this opportunity, you'll need um, a tax ID and W-9 form. So as the, the organization is listed on your W-9 is how you'll want to put that into the system. So you'll enter in the, the full legal name of your organization, address, all the contact information, um, as well as the, the contact information for the person who will be submitting this proposal. So the lead person for this proposal or for the project that you have in mind. You'll click submit. Now, something to know about the system, if you already have, which I, I highly doubt that anyone already has something in the system because it's so new, but if you were to already have um, your organization listed in the system, so an icon will pop up once you hit submit and it will say, hey, we already have an organization by that name in the system. Would you like to create a new one or continue as that organization? You know, you'll feel free to answer that question the way it makes sense. If it's an organization that is not yours, obviously create a new one. But if there is an organization in the system that is already like your organization is in the system, don't create a separate organization. Just continue with the, the previous one. So once you set that up, because you put in your email address, you'll receive an email from the system asking that you register. That'll go like any other pl platform or portal that you decide to, to log into. you will have your email address and they'll have you set up your login and password. So I'm going to show you all from your perspective what it will look like to actually be an applicant. So this is called your applicant homepage. Um, and once you've you've made your profile, it's going to ask you to set up your organization profile. So once you've logged into the system, you're at this homepage, you're going to update your organization profile. And here will be where you can indicate the type of organization that you have um, and just answer all these questions, a small organization description, the address, which should populate from what you already entered in for your registering your organization. Um, as well as your primary contact information, website if you want to include it, social media, SAM number four, um, particularly for grantees. And this won't really apply to anyone here because everything will be less than $10,000. But if you were applying to a grant that was more than that, you'd have to include some financial statements and they will populate here. And then this is where you'll include your W-9 form. Um, just We just ask that it's signed and dated. Um, because there's a uh, people tend to forget that on the form is where you can indicate the address, the name, your tax number, unique identifier. And then there's a part close to the middle bottom of the first page to ask for a signature and date. Just make sure you fill that out completely. And then that will populate down here. And you'll answer these questions for, again, since this is a grant opportunity, you'll answer these questions for financial accounting systems that you currently have in place for your organization. You'll hit save draft that'll save to your organization profile. So now step one is complete of creating your organization profile and you've registered to CSTAR. So now it's time to view the active grant RFPs that we have in the system right now. You're gonna click this button and you see here's the opportunity that you would be applying for. Ocean Odyssey Grants Marine Debris Prevention Awards for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Justice, and Accessibility. And you'll click apply to RFP. Once you click apply to RFP, if you notice, we have in big important letters here to hit the start application button, which is this button right here, in order to begin your application. If you don't do that, there's no, really you can't enter in any information and it won't save. So you wanna make sure that you follow those instructions first and click that blue start application button. And I'm actually gonna show you all over on the side here, if you go back to your applicant homepage, in the step three, it'll show you all of your drafts submissions if someone if you've been accepted and there's revisions requested you'll see them indicated here you also receive emails along the way through the system um, and then execution and close if you were selected and it goes through the process but i'm actually going to show you 
here exactly what this application looks like as this test user. So once you click start application, all the information you pulled, you put in for your organization profile, it's going to pull over and it's going to be listed right here. So the organization description, all the information you listed for all of these, these different fields will be pulled over. So you won't have to worry about doing that. You can edit it if you would like your, your organization description. Now, as Aaron indicated earlier, for this award opportunity, we're asking that you fill out a completely separate form application template. So in the in that application template, if you've looked at the RFP and you've seen that form, you can click on it. It's a Google Doc form that you'll have to download and it's a regular application. So you'll completely fill that out and you'll upload it in this system right here under supplemental attachments. So other than that, what we are asking that you fill out, and this is also indicated in the RFP clearly, is all the required fields. So the required fields are indicated with this asterisk here in the application. And all of them, they're all title, amount requested, start and end date, and then at the very bottom, agreement signatory. Those are the only things that we're asking that you fill out on this portal. Again, you have a completely separate application form that you'll complete and you'll upload that to supplemental attachments right here, as long as well as other any other supplemental materials that you want to be included into your your um, application. So whether that's letters or you know anything that you want to add in addition to, you can add to supplemental attachments in this section. Other than that, for example, project description, goals and outcomes, technical expertise and capabilities of the applicant organization. These fields you can leave blank. Because again, you're filling out that the attached um, application and uploading it in the supplemental attachments section. The only other things I think are necessary to mention um, are the contacts. So if you are an organization and maybe you're the project lead, but you have some people who you'd like to either help you with the application or you would like to be able to see the application in their portal as well, you'll have to add them as an alternate contact in the application. And that's also listed right here, um, the language, but I just wanted to point that out. So how you'll do that is you'll click this little box button and the plus, you'll put in their information and you hit invite. Once you hit invite, they'll get an email, just like you did from the system, to register in the system. And once they register, they'll be associated with your organization and in their applicant home, just as you can see the drafts and submissions and all of that, they'll see that application go through the system and they can make edits to this application and see it as it progresses through the system as well. Um, again, the agreement signatory is mandatory, it's required. Um, so please make sure that you're doing the same thing here, plus button, putting their information and clicking invite. That's the tricky thing. Just be sure to click invite because we've noticed that sometimes people will put in the system and hit save. But if you don't click invite, that email won't go to them. And actually, you'll be able to see in the status here, it'll say active or accepted once they've accepted the invitation to be the agreement signatory. And then there's also financial contacts. Feel free to add those as well. It will just mean that if you were selected for this opportunity, we would have to ask you less questions later down the line, but it's not required if you don't want to fill it out at this current moment. It just will have to be eventually. Once you've completed everything and again submitted that supplemental, the all the materials you need to the supplemental attachment section, this section right here, you'll go to the bottom and you'll hit submit. You can save this draft and come back to it at any point now that you're registered in the system and it will show up again in your applicant homepage and step three over here in drafts. But once you hit submit, it'll be submitted. You should get a confirmation email and that's it, voila. I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint and everything that I just mentioned as is in the RFP as well as in these slides and we'll share those with you at the very end um, of this this session. Thank you, Kaya. Um, before we go on to some questions and answers, I just wanted to reiterate a few things about this opportunity. Um, first, just a reminder that applications will close on November 20th. And I really wanna encourage everyone to take time to read through the full RFP. Uh, we went to um, great effort to try to include all the information that we could think of to help you develop out your programs. 
Um, all the evaluation criteria is there. So as you are thinking about your project, you can compare yourself to the criteria to see where there might be gaps um, in that as well. And also that we have an email that we'll send out with these materials afterwards, but it's also in the RFP and that is support at marinesanctuary.org. And if you have any questions about the proposal or any questions or need any assistance with the CSTAR platform, we'll be monitoring that and ready to help you right away. Um, but right now I see we, that we do have some questions. So I'm going to um, bring Haley back on so we can start answering your questions. Yes, thank you, Erin. Um, so we have our first question, um, which is to elaborate on interception technologies that were mentioned as not being eligible under the competition priorities. So interception technology includes devices that are deployed into the environment to either passively or actively capture marine debris. And some examples include booms, um, and bins and stormwater catch basins, for example. Um, this person also asked if disposal receptacles, such as monofilament fishing line collection bins, are considered, uh, considered interception technology. And the answer is no. So these collection bins would be considered small scale alternative disposal methods, um, and they would be eligible for consideration uh, as part of a holistic prevention project. And if there are any other questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A function uh, with. And it looks like Haley froze for a minute. So I'm gonna um, answer another question that I saw coming in. And um, I had it on a slide, but I didn't really speak to it. And that is that um, if you are, if you have received an Ocean Odyssey grant previously, either under the Marine Debris Program or the Ocean Education Program, are you eligible to apply again? And the answer is yes, you are absolutely eligible to apply again. Um, the next question that we have, um, let me see, do we have another question? Um, there is a question, Erin. Nope. Okay. Um, about uh, the current projects that we're funding, um, if there are ideas or ways that those grantees are reaching their DEJA goals through those projects. Um, so I think that that's very project specific, but a great question. So Erin, if you wanna tackle yes. that first. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I can say in the previous round of funding, we had a little bit different focus um, for, the, for the projects, still DEJA focused. And in the RFP, we tried to put some specifics about how you could identify underserved and underrepresented communities. Um, there are some tools you can use to actually um, identify uh, those areas, or you can provide your own support if you have an underserved community that you want to work with and you have your own way of, um, of acknowledging them as that. We will review all of that as well. So. So a lot of our current applicants are working in communities that are identified as underserved under the CGEST federal tool for underserved communities and working directly with those communities. And it's really important that when you're working with these communities that, that, the, that the underserved communities are part of the whole project, that they're part of the planning and the implementation of the projects. So I hope that I answered your question. And if I didn't answer it completely or clearly, feel free to email us or drop another question into, into the Q&A. And Erin, I wanted yeah. to, to, yeah. to add in that yeah. the CGIS tool is actually linked in the RFP as well. So if you're, you're like, what is she talking about with CGIS? That's in the RFP in the evaluation criteria table as well. Great. Thank you, Kaya, for, for reminding me of that. Um, will this yes, recording I'll, be sent out to all? Erin, um, can, I, oh, can I add yeah. one more note yes, to that? Yes, please, please. Um, yes, I just wanted to add one more note to the previous question. So at the bottom of the RFP as well, we provide some definitions um, that, of course, explain Deja, but also touch on meaningful engagement, um, which Erin was explaining about how 
Um, you're expected to engage with community members fully and completely throughout the life of the project, but also in a meaningful way. Um, so we do provide that definition uh, if it's helpful to understand kind of what that level of engagement means and um, making sure that it's not just one way outreach, as Aaron also said. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Um, a couple questions I'm seeing. What is the acceptance rate for first round grants? So in the first round that we issued, um, we had 53 applications and we made 12 awards. Um, in this round, we have a little more funding available. So we have increased the ceiling of the amount you can apply for to 10,000. Last year, it was 7,500. And we have increased the funding level. So we're anticipating making a few more awards this year than we, uh, next year for the current app, uh, funding round than the one that we have right now. But the rate will depend on how many applications that we receive. Um, will the recording be sent out to all participants? Yes, we will send this recording out to everybody who registered and is participating today, as well as those that uh, expressed interest in participating but weren't available and submitted um, the request to register on the Google form. So let's see if anything else is coming in. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. Um, so Kaya, would you mind advancing to the next slide? So just a reminder, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we are available to continue to answer your questions as you work through considering your projects and work to submit your applications. And here again is the email that you can reach out to us at any time. A reminder that proposals are due at 1159 Eastern Standard Time on November 20th. Um, the, the platform will close at that time to accept any more proposals. And we really appreciate everyone joining today and the interest in this opportunity. And we look forward to seeing all your project submissions. Have a wonderful afternoon.